So today what we're going to do is we're going to begin with a, a brief period of, uh, of breath meditation. And then I have a video of Kristen Neff. Uh, she's really the person who really, um, really got this whole kind of self-compassion thing going, at least in terms of mindfulness, with a piece she published in 2006, in which she uh, published the instrument that you have in front of you. And this has probably been the, probably the most used instrument used in a, uh, assessing self-compassion. So what I'd like you to do, if, if, we, if we don't get to it today, and we may, uh, take this home and find out, find out where you're at with each of these. And, and I'll say a little bit at the end to, to help you to interpret it. Also what we're going to do today is briefly discuss uh, this one handout having to do self-compassion versus self-esteem. And then uh, we'll talk about mindfulness, compassion, and, and how they work together to create the sense of well-being, which is what Kristen Neff is after. So let's take that time now. So making sure our cell phones and other electronic devices are disarmed, and taking a pause in our, our eating and drinking. And then once again, finding that seat of dignity, whatever that is for you. So we're sitting upright, and our back is straight. Our neck is long, chin slightly down, allowing the shoulders to relax, it's falling gently off the back, arms gently falling down along the sides, and you may have your hands resting on your thighs, you may have them cupped in your hands, you could have them in the arms of your chair. Uh, the important thing is that it's comfortable and that we can breathe fully and expansively in a posture that encourages us to be awake. And so over time, we kind of play with that and we find what works best for us. So I invite you now to close your eyes or gaze gently down in front of you. We've taken this opportunity to arrive, to arrive here, right now, in this place, in this moment, to be present to ourselves. So I invite you to bring your attention to your breath, the in-breath and the out-breath. Breathing in and breathing out. The steady flow of the breath in and out. Through no effort of our own, we breathe. We don't have to force it or make it happen. It comes naturally, easily. So allowing the body to settle into the steadiness of the breath, the easiness of the breath. And yet we notice the breath is alive. Clearly it's a sign of life. So paying attention to the breath, the in-breath and the out-breath. And perhaps finding that place in the breath where the breath for us is most alive, most noticeable. Perhaps that's in the area of the abdomen, the tummy. Noticing how that area will expand and contract with the in-breath and the out-breath. Or perhaps it's in the area of of the chest and the upper torso, noticing how that area will rise and fall with the in-breath and the out-breath. Or in the area of the head, the nose, the nostrils, noticing how the air seems cool coming in and warm going out. So finding that sweet spot on the breath, perhaps it's someplace else entirely, 
but it's your breath, it's your place. Allowing a full breath in and a full breath out. By now your, your mind may have wandered off into thought. Well, the mind does what the mind does, it thinks. And so what we're going to do is we're going to bring our attention back to the breath. We're going to allow the mind to do what the mind does. We're going to allow it to think. But we're going to come back to the breath. The in-breath and the out-breath. And if we're distracted by thoughts or feelings or stories or analysis, the past or the future, we take note of it. And when we're ready, we come back to the breath the in-breath and the out-breath. And as we pay attention to the breath, we, we do notice thoughts, we do notice feelings, and, and we do take note of those. Because that's information that somewhere down the line might be of use to us. But we continue to pay attention to the breath. And the great thing about the breath is no matter where we go, no matter what we do, no matter what our circumstances are, we can always come home to the breath, any time, any place. And each and every time we bring the mind to the breath, we bring the mind into the present moment. We bring our mind into our experience of whatever it is we're doing. So paying attention to the breath, the in-breath and the out-breath. That sweet spot in the breath. The felt experience of the breath in and out. This is Kristen F. talking on the three components of compassion. And she mentions all of them in the introduction, but she only really gets through like one and a half. And for the life of me, I cannot find anywhere in YouTube or anywhere else part two and part three, at least not of this talk. But that's not a problem. Uh, we can work with that and I can fill in the gaps. But I thought it was important that you saw her talking about compassion. How do I define um, self-compassion then? I really don't see a difference between compassion for self and others. I define them exact, the exact same way. I argue that self-compassion has the components of a sense of kindness, kindness, care, uh, understanding for yourself versus judgment, a sense of common humanity versus feeling isolated and cut off from others, um, and then a sense of mindfulness, right, being aware of the suffering that's occurring versus over-identification, which, again, I'll just clarify this in one moment. Let's go through each one separately. Okay, so self-kindness versus self-judgment. Kindness is more than just um, 
hearts and flowers, okay? Kindness has a very active um, component to it. It means when you're kind to yourself, you really want to comfort yourself when you're suffering. You want to alleviate your suffering. You want to soothe yourself, okay? It's a, it's a very active um, stance where I want to do whatever I can to help myself feel as good as possible in this moment, okay? Common humanity, um, really framing one's own experience in light of the common human experience. It's very funny, if I were to ask any of you, you know, are a human being? Are you a human being? Yes, of course. Is everyone else a human being? Yes, of course. Does everyone else suffer? Yes, of course. You would say that logically, but in the moment when you just blew it at work, or you had someone reject you, or something really bad happens in your life, what happens non-rationally is that we get very egocentric. We feel like, why me? This is somehow has happened to me. I'm the only one who's messed up. I'm the only one who's going through that difficult time. And we feel really cut off from others. It's as if somehow when things go wrong, that's abnormal. You know, this is not supposed to be this way. Something has gone wrong. But you know, is that the case? Has anything gone wrong? Is anything abnormal? No. <laughs> You know, that's what life is. Life goes wrong. No one in here signed a contract before you got, you know, born in this world saying, I would be perfect, my life would be perfect. And yet it's like, this is not the plan I signed up for. I'm pissed off about it, right? That's how we, that's how we react. Um, the problem with that, and there's a lot of problems with that, but one of the main things is when we feel isolated and cut off from others, you know, physiologically, that's very frightening. If you think evolutionary, what, evolutionarily, one of the worst things that can happen to us is to be isolated from the group, because then we aren't safe. Um, and it's interesting, this aspect of well-being, I don't think has been studied enough. This sense of can we feel connected to others in our suffering, or do we feel isolated from others in our suffering? And just, I can tell you, in the workshops I've conducted, especially the eight-week ones, at the end, I ask people what they got out of this the most, Almost every single person says common humanity. I realize it's not just me. It's not just me who judges myself. It's not just me who suffers like this. Very important to remember that this is the human experience. This is how things are supposed to be. Okay, there's nothing has gone wrong. Yes, it's painful, but it's normal. It's natural. And then this is where the mindfulness comes in. Um, you have to be aware of your suffering in order to give it compassion. So um, mindfulness allows you not only to notice your suffering, but very important, and we'll talk about this more, to be with your suffering as it is. We don't like to be around suffering. If we could just get rid of pain, you know, we'd do it. Um, and we have lots of psychological mechanisms to avoid that, again, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. So self-compassion says, wow, pain is occurring. Can I turn toward that? Can I be with that? And you actually need to do that to be able to give yourself the caring and support you need. All right. Now, some people do say, come on, you have to notice your suffering. Isn't it like blindingly obvious I'm suffering? But it's often really not. Um, the pain caused by self-judgment, I think in some ways that's some of the worst pain all of us experience. You know, a constant, niggly, niggly pain. I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not this enough, I blew it, I'm this, I'm that. But often we are so lost in the role of self-critic that we don't really stop to realize, oh my God, this is really, really hurting. You know? And in some ways it feels more comfortable to be the self-critic because at least the self-critic isn't the person that messed up. <laughs> You know, the self-critic knows you messed up. The, per the part of you that feels really, you know, vulnerable and insecure and a failure. Um, often we don't give that sort of side of the um, process as much attention, okay? And then also very um, important when things go wrong in our lives, <coughs> very often we go straight into problem-solving mode. It's like, there's a problem. I don't want there to be a problem. I need to fix the problem, you know, immediately. Um, and what happens is we go straight into problem-solving mode and don't stop to, again, turn towards the suffering and say, whew, this is really hard, this is difficult, I need a little, I need a little care and compassion to get me through this, then we, aren't, we really aren't at our best and our most psychologically stable when we go um, towards trying to fix that problem. Okay, so it's actually something you have to remind yourself to do before going straight into fixing problems to just acknowledge and validate how difficult the situation is.
can you relate to any of that, identify with any of that? Do you see yourself in that? You know, one of the key ideas that she has is that we all suffer. It's, it's common to all of us. We're hardly unique. And, uh, and one of the things that we have in common also is that we're, we're really hard on ourselves. We really should ourselves. And, and sometimes we can become our, our, best, our worst enemy. But the idea behind compassion is we can also be our, our best friend, our very best friend. Which reminds me, you know, the very first thing I think I said to you in this course is, is that there was no one more deserving of your care than you. And there was no one more interesting that you know. So get to know yourself. Also, we have to have the resources inside of us that we need in order to take care of ourselves. That compassion is already there, just like that suffering is already there. And the idea is, is that once we can touch that suffering even a little bit, then compassion will come to that. The compassion that's already there, it's not forced. It's not like say, I want to be compassionate. When I begin to touch my own suffering, my own compassion towards myself will begin to come out. And, and then we become very intentional about it. So I can be kind towards myself. So when I see this film over and over again, those are some of the things that come to me. Maybe something came to you that struck you. Hoppa? Yeah, go ahead. I make those sociological themes. There's a, a theory called positive asymmetry, but rather than the individual. I mean, she did talk about being part of a group and being isolated. But positive asymmetry goes to our culture on how we're not allowed. We are really not allowed that, uh, that experience she's talking about, you know, that experience where this is really hurting me and, you know, I can, I can either deal with it, live with it, and then go on. And um, some of the arguments that they make, if anybody remembers positive asymmetry, we take pills now. So you go to a funeral, someone died that you really love. The loss is great, almost overwhelming, but you're not allowed to suffer. The first thing that happens is the doctor comes over and asks if you would like to have a tranquilizer. And so I see some similarities. Is she a psychologist? Yes. Yeah. And there, there's always some similarities. But um, because she's a psychologist, she kind of goes to the individual and works from there, and I go to the society. Yeah. And, and but I found that really interesting. Uh, yeah. I found it really interesting when she says it's okay to be self-pity, you know, to be kind to yourself, but you have to, from that, oh my God, everybody, you know, hurting me, and I'm so sad. She says you have to come in problem-solving mode. You have to identify the problem. You have to be with that. Like, you have to grieve. You know, grieving when you're losing someone, you know, you're losing a friend, you may be losing a relationship, but you have to say, okay, it's a problem, but instead of saying, oh my God, I just want to have another friend, yeah, or I would like to have a pill and make me feel better, I have to see how I can solve it. It's okay to be sad, but I need to find a way to kind of project and see the light at the end of the tunnel. And I think it's for probably a lot of people who are suffering by the crossing the line, you know, between life and death, it's they don't see the light. And I think with this mindfulness, you constantly thinking, it's, it's okay, it's okay, you know, allow yourself to hurt, you know, allow yourself to cry. And it's really difficult. American society is not like this. You have to be tough, you have to persevere, you have to, if you stay true to yourself, if you, you will be that hero, you will be unbroken. It will break at some point. Yeah. And I think what her idea was to kind of be, come back from that broken stage and function again, that was really, for me, was quite amazing. And you'll notice that she didn't say the problem, it, it, problem solving isn't a problem. She said we move too quickly to problem solving. And so a problem is based on our, our under, under, to come up with a solution, we really have to have, you know, a grasp of what the problem is. And the problem is, in some sense, with our thinking, but it's also with our emotions. And, and so we have to really have a sense of what those are you know, to be able to really come up with, with a good, and, and that's part of the solution, is just being with them. It, it's, there's, there's two principles here at work. One is resistance and the other is, is letting go. When we give resistance to those, to, to the, those uncomfortable feelings, 
rather than helping them to go away, we're really giving them life. Resistance holds them in place, in, in a sense, okay? But if we can be with those uncomfortable feelings, then we allow them, we let go of them. And so there isn't that resistance, there's an opportunity for them to move on. And when psychologists talk about emotion, they, they talk about, about healthy emotions as being those, no matter how strong, no matter how tense, no matter how awful, they come and they, and they go. Okay, and so at, at some level we're allowing for that. We're, we're, letting, we're letting go, we're allowing for the passing of that. But if there's that resistance, then in a sense it holds it in place. And so shooting and the many other things that we do uh, can create that resistance. And, and, and the sad thing is, is that at some level what, we, what we're doing we think is really in our best interest. Uh, but in fact it's, it's, it's not. And so yeah, uh, yeah. We have to be willing to sit with it. And then that's we recognize it, then she says, okay, now we know we're there. Now what I would do is I want to be kind to myself. And that's where the mindfulness comes in, the intentionality. Well, I'm a, my intention is I recognize where I'm at emotionally. Okay, my intention is to bring compassion to myself. Okay, and so I have to choose the kind of attitude that I'm going to bring. I'm going to bring kindness. I'm going to bring uh, gentleness. And so at that point then we can soothe ourselves. And I have an activity that, that will demonstrate that in just a minute, but I, I don't want to cut off anybody else that has any thoughts in this, no matter how off, off the wall they might be. How about some of you guys? Any, any, to strike a chord with you at all? Do you feel like you're a little too hard on yourself sometimes? Yeah, yeah. Doesn't feel very good, does it? Nah. Yeah. And do you ever beat yourself up for beating yourself up? I mean, that's high level shooting. That's, you know, yeah, yeah. And we do that too. We do that too. Because at some level we know it's not working for us. And so we beat ourselves up for beating ourselves up. And then, of course, it, it feeds on itself. And it's that resistance. And so those things that are troubling for us change very slowly, if at all versus just being willing to be with it, even if it's just a little bit. And I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy at all. I remember last Friday after this class, uh, during the class there was a couple of things that w went on that, that I wasn't happy with myself and my shooter went into, went into, went into play. And uh, it really didn't catch up with me until after we were done. And, you know, and I just had to sit with the feelings that are under with, underneath it. And the feelings didn't have anything to do with you in this group. It had more to do with my history, you know, and it hit, it hit some real nerves in the areas of shame and stuff like that, and it was, it was really, really uncomfortable. And I went into it, I went away from it, I went to it, and I can't say it went right away, but I was willing to be with it the best I could be, because I know that I have to be in order to allow that to move. And so my own experience shows that, that, that had I created resistance, I could have gotten real busy you know, I could have exercised, eating, using drugs, I didn't do that, haven't done that in a long time, but I could have done something to resist it or ignore it or whatever, you know, and so, and so it's challenging, it's not, it's not easy, but then what did I do towards self-compassion? Well, I realized that I need to be doing more self-compassion. It isn't just enough to be with it, but I have to message myself in positive ways. And so I begin to look at my experience here, and I, I tried to do an honest assessment of what, what was working, what could I have done better, you know, without the should. You know, and if and I felt the shudge coming in, I kind of noticed it. So it's a process, and we're going to look at a video next week, and uh, that uh, where he talks about it. With little by little, these these things add up, and suddenly we find ourselves in a different place. Um, other thoughts on on the video? Okay, well then let me talk a little bit about the handout that you have in front of you. It's the one that starts at the top with kindness. And it identifies the three qualities, excuse me, of, of compassion. And in her early work, uh, Kristen have talked about self-compassion and compassion for others. And now in her most recent work, she just talks about compassion. And it's interesting, in, uh, studies have shown that uh, people that tend to have more compassion for others than they do for themselves, they don't have as high a sense of well-being as people who have either more compassion for themselves or equal amounts. So if I'm not okay with me at some level, I'm inclined to have more compassion for others than myself. 
Isn't that interesting? But I want you to keep this in mind. That's still my compassion. That compassion originated in me. It's, it's mine. Now, it may be showing up in my relationship to you, but that came from me. And so that compassion I extend towards you could just as easily be extended towards me because it's, I'm the source. I'm the source. So if I'm here, if I'm going to criticize myself and say, oh, gee, I have more compassion for others than I do for myself, you know, that's your compassion. That's your compassion. You're the source. Well, in that handout, it lists, uh, I think it says kindness, mindfulness, and what's the third thing? Uh, humanity, a common humanity. I think she really touched on that really well. I am not alone. I am not alone. Suffering is universal. It is universal. It is universal. My. Absolutely. Now, this problem with yourself, but you're kind to others. Is that then your kindness is truly comes from open heart? Because there creates a situation where you say, I'm such a good person. I'm so kind to others. Why the others are not so kind to me? So then you're doing good things with expectation they're going to come back to. Is that the right thing? That's a great question because when we talk about being mindful, we talk about intention, but we also talk about attitude. And the very first thing I want to do before I choose an attitude, which may be kindness, I have to check my attitude at the door. And another way of ask, saying that is, what is my motive? So I may be choosing kindness, but the motive behind it may not in fact be that it may be self-serving, it may be people-pleasing, it may be some sense of insecurity, you know, and so I'm acting in a way, you know, but really that's the issue. So, and so that's what I mean by check your attitude at the door. Because if I am truly kind and compassionate towards someone, that happens without expectation. Mm -hmm. That's a natural thing. So if I am kind towards someone and, and, and they don't appreciate it, and I'm hurt, then, well, then maybe, and that's another way of finding out whether or not I was in touch with that kind of thing. Yeah. Because the kindness can be interpreted by, you know, donating your time, uh -huh. money thing, but it's not, there's, there should be no expectation of that. A lot of people do say, oh my God, you know, we did so much, and such and such people didn't do as much, you know, so there's kind of sense of judgment sometimes and kind of. Uh-huh. It's like asking for forgiveness. Uh, say you've injured someone and you, and you, you go ask for forgiveness. And, and I've had this in the past. I remember when I first got clean in 12-step programs, one of the things you do is you, you do an inventory and then you make, you make direct and indirect amends to those you've harmed. And, uh, and I remember that first initial set of amends. I mean, I, in my mind, I'd really harmed these people. But, uh, but I found that when I did that, I had a certain expectation. You know, and, uh, and that I expected them some level to respond a certain way, you know. And they never responded the way I expected them to, okay. But I came to realize it wasn't about me, you know, that it was really about them. And, and so that, there was kind of that process. But I wasn't always aware of what my motives were as I went into the situation. It's kind of like I found out after the fact, okay. So... You know, we give it our best judgment and, and then we learn from that. And so, but I have to allow for that pain. I have to go, oh, that really hurt. I remember I gave, I made an amends with this, this fellow and he was actually, this is kind of a crazy thing. He was actually involved with my girlfriend at the time. <clears throat> kind of a messy situation. I don't want to say any more than that. I think you get the idea. And, and, but, but yet I felt like, I felt that, that in our relationship, I owed him amends, okay? And, and so I went and I apologized. And because in any bad relationship, you always have some part in that, right? If nothing else, the way you react to it or the way you think about it. And, and he was just all over my stuff, like you da da da, like I was the worst thing that, and that clearly wasn't what I expected, you know? Uh, but that's okay, that's okay. Because that is life, that happens. I don't know, I find a lot of value in saying, like, saying that to myself all the time. I say, you know what, this is just the way it is. Everybody goes through this, you know? And part of acceptance, a great definition of acceptance that I really, really like, and it's an easy one for me to see, is that acceptance is just being willing to be with things as they are. Notice I said being willing to be with things as they are. I may not be w willing. And so I have, oh, I'm willing, okay, okay, I'm willing, I'm open. 
And, and if that, then, then I can come to learn to be more or less okay with that. But I have to have that willing and that openness. And then, to see, it's that allowing. There's either resistance or there's allowing. Which of the two am I choosing, resistance or allowing? And so I have to develop that pattern of allowing. And that's where the mindfulness becomes so important. If we don't have that awareness, then we don't have that choice. And our, and our, and our, natural, our natural instinct is reactivity, which means to, uh, to, to, to not act mindfully. To, you know, and so we just continue to do these things that don't really allow us to be with stuff. You have thought or? Well, I, uh, I hear that frequently. It is the way it is, okay? What if there is a humongous disturbance at, you know, at a, at a macro level, so to speak? And, you know, you just, if you keep on studying it, studying it, you see, I mean, there's so much evidence that this is just not leading to anything functional. Well, then how would you change? Well, to accept, accept something is, is, recognize, to, is another way of saying that is recognizing it for what it is, okay? And, and, and that may mean that in recognizing it for what it is, I, I experience it as, as, as very painful. I mean, if I look at various kinds of injustices and inequities in the world, if I really get in touch with the humanity of it, it's a very painful thing. Or a family member who's suffering, that's a very painful thing. But part of accepting it is, is just seeing it for what it is. And seeing it for what includes not only my cognitive experience of it, but my emotional experience. And so I have to be willing to at least acknowledge that. That's acceptance. That has nothing to do with liking it. It has nothing to do with wanting to change it. But again, it's like that problem solving thing. Now I have really complete information. You know, I've got, and now I'm in a position to reel something about it. An interesting study that kind of touches on this. It looked, at, uh, it looked at young Germans and young Jews, and it had to do with uh, the whole thing with the Nazis and, and the Holocaust and all of that. And what they did is one group of, of, of young Jews were, were uh, who had, they all had resentment, the Jews all had resentments towards, towards Germans. So that was kind of the precondition going in over that. And, uh, and so one group of, of, of Jewish uh, young people uh, were uh, asked, uh, and I don't know the particulars of the study, asked to forgive the, 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 the Germans and, uh, as a group. And they, they didn't. Uh, but they were asked to, to uh, have compassion for the individual Germans and to understand their suffering and their own suffering. And guess what happened? There was a high level of forgiveness. Why? Well, one of the explanations that Kristen Neff talks about in her book is common humanity. They suffer, we suffer, and out of our suffering, we sometimes make awful, awful choices, you know? So there's something about recognizing my suffering and other sufferings that, that kind of draws us together. You know, in politics, we often complain about, you know, you know those people, they don't walk in our shoes, you know? And, uh, and there is something, too, about that empathy and that, that feeling with and everything. And so what Kristen Neff is saying in real simple terms is what's going on with me emotionally and, you know, and, and then what kind of kindness can I intentionally bring, bring to that. So I want to try something with you. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is, it's going to be very brief, just for a couple minutes. So if you would, uh, even with the distraction of the uh, outside noise, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to Take someone that loves you or that likes you very much. And that can be, be, include your dog. I've done this with my dog Winslow. Uh, and, uh, and then what you're going to do is you're going to hold that, a picture or that name in the mind's eye and just sit with that, that person and their love for you. So let's close our eyes or James gently down in front of us and choose that person that loves us. We can see them. And as we allow that image to settle in, not only to our mind, but into our body, perhaps noticing how that feels in our body, where it feels in our body, and just holding that image 
that image of warmth and love, perhaps kindness, care, just allowing that, holding that, and if we get distracted, coming back to that for just a little longer. That warmth, that care in my mind, in my heart, in my body. Okay, you may open your eyes. Now, some of you may have had the experience of, of how it travels from here through here. You might have had a warmth. Uh, it can be different for each of us. But this is what's interesting, and we'll talk more about this next week for the next video. Research shows that if you can sustain your focus on something for, for 12 to 13 seconds, you develop new gray matter in the brain. And so what happens is this particular experience that you had now becomes, in some sense, permanent and fixed. Now, it's just a little gray matter, not a lot of gray matter. In any stage in life, you can develop new gray matter. I've looked at studies where you can develop new gray matter at 65. I'm 65, thank goodness. Uh, but you can develop new gray matter. So what if I had repeated exposures to this or something similar? It grows and grows and grows. And so what happens is, is we, in a very real sense, develop a new nature. Our old nature may have been less compassionate, but our new nature over time becomes more compassionate. And so we use the mind to train, you use the, the mind uses the brain to change the brain. The mind uses the brain to change the brain, but it's intentional, it's mindful. I choose to be with us. So now what does it have to do with mindfulness? And this is where we were heading for today. So I'm going to be talking to my wife, and it's about her not washing the dishes two nights in a row. And by the way, that doesn't happen 99 times out of 100, I'm the one being called in my stuff. Okay. So if this were to come up, I really need to check my attitude at the door, right? Because what we do, intention, get clarification, attitude, well, I'm, I'm curious. But that's the way I even said it. Yeah. Yeah, but what's my, I got to check my attitude. Get back time, finally, you know? I've been there more than once, okay? So what if that is? Okay, maybe I should just wait. Or maybe acknowledge that and go, well, let's just, oh, wait a minute, okay, let's, maybe I really am curious, but I can choose out of knowing what I already am, all right? So this is the point. So I engage her. Let's say this is a heated situation in the past. It's never really worked, okay? So this time I do it, and the whole time I remain curious, I remain kind, and what I'm doing now is I am defining this relationship and this experience in a new way, in a new umbrella. It's in the context of, in the tone of kindness. And so maybe there is this stuff here, this bad stuff here, but this is being held in, transformed by this tone of kindness. And when you look at this video of Dan Harris next week, he talks about this process, how we can take the new, the good, and, and, and transform the bad, because we're holding it in the context of the good. And so if I can do this with my wife, and I gotta tell you, my wife and I were really in trouble in our marriage, and we did a lot of couples therapy, and this is kind of what we did. I wish I had meditation then, maybe we wouldn't have had the trouble we did. But, but, but what happens over time, it changes. The relation, and guess what? You're getting new gray. This is not just behavioral, psychological. Your brain changes. This is what the science shows. So if we can be intentional, have that attitude, and pay attention, then that transformation can occur little by little over time. And so that little exercise we did, if I would do that just once a day, just once a day, that can make a huge difference. And so self-compassion is where we might say some kind things to ourselves. Okay, um, any questions before we move on? Why, we have five minutes left and, and, and seven, if, if you could, eight if you can believe that. So why don't you go ahead and fill out the survey and uh, let's see what kind of results you get. And before we leave, even if you're not finished, I'll talk a little bit about the categories so you know how to make sense of it. But I can tell you right up front, that it's the same as she had on her first slide. You know, you have, you have the, the, the kind of the, the good side and the bad side. So you have isolation, common humanity. You have kindness versus self-judgment. You have common humanity uh, versus over-identification or mindfulness. 
So go ahead and fill that out. Okay, we're uh, just about out of time, so I'm going to ask you to stop now. I thought we'd take a couple minutes of breath meditation. And then when we uh, end the meditation, uh, choosing to be mindful today, choosing to be intentional, checking our attitude at the door, choosing the attitude we want, and then paying attention, noticing our experience of what we're doing while we're doing it and learning from it. Okay. Thank you all for being here today. So once again, finding our breath, the in-breath and the out-breath, coming home to the breath, that sweet spot in the breath, our place, our home, our breath, right here, right now, paying attention, noticing. the in-breath and the out-breath. Knowing that when the mind wanders, we can always come back to the breath. So next week is positive thinking and we can talk about the kinds of thoughts that we want to bring to the suffering that we experience. Okay, see you then. Thank you all for being here.